Good afternoon, everyone. Sorry, I have this bad habit of wandering around, so I have the same problem as Gaurav has. So I'll probably try and live with this. So uh, what I'll try and do today is talk about certain use cases that are live in Oman or those that can be done in Oman. So I'm not going to talk about too much of global things. I think it's relevant for us to discuss things that, cannot be, that can be applied here. So this is what I wanted to share with all of you, a little piece of introduction with ourselves. What are the use cases that we have deployed globally? And what are the use cases and association that we have been running with Oridu that can be applied in this market in the near run? I wanted to discuss the smart chairs that you guys are sitting on, but unfortunately that I'm not at liberty to do that. I'm just kidding. Okay, so, uh, you know, we as Tata's, a brief introduction to us. I think Tata Group, um, all of you probably would be aware, it's a $100 billion plus group. What I represent is Tata Communications Transformation Services. This is a managed services arm of Tata Communications. And what we do is we enable telcos to be smart about how they go about implementing IoT. So this is a typical architecture. Today, I think since morning, we have spoken a lot about sensors. We have talked about technologies. We have talked about platforms. I thought just like our name is, we are integrators. So I'll integrate all of them into one page and show you how it works. So if you move from left to right, you have the sensors on the extreme left side, which use an access technology. This access technology uses the backhaul of a operator to kind of convey to the network server. Now, just one word of caution, network server is a specific element that gets applied when it's a LPWA technology like LoRa. And we discussed about LPWA in the morning. I think it's one of those substantial levers that operators and enterprises today are looking at to maximize the value that they get out of this. So network servers along with the horizontal platforms, they together comprise as we call the brain of the entire IoT value chain. On the horizontal platform, then you develop the applications which are supposed to take care of those specific use cases that you want to implement. So that's how it works. And behind all of this, of course, you have the entire, I would say, care center which needs to look at your access to network. It has to look into your applications, whether they are running, not running, what's the problem. And therefore, you can also have second level of detailing, which is to say that are there specific complex events that you need to monitor? Are you missing out on something? Are you meeting the SLAs that you give out to your enterprises? So in a nutshell, TCTS is an organization which plays across the value chain, but not to say that we do everything, no. What we do is we, inter we essentially bring together all the elements of the value chain such that they work in a cohesive manner. And here at Oman, the intention has been to work closely with Oridu business to bring certain use cases to life and prepare Oridu in a way or Oman in a way such that it can sustain over the next five to 10 years of you know, terrific growth that we envisage in Oman on IoT. So if you look at this chart carefully, I've called out those specific pieces that will always belong to the infrastructure owner of a particular country. While this is called out as Oridu backhaul, which enables the access technology and the Oridu cloud, I think Oridu cloud is something which is very important given the data restrictions and security that all of us have been discussing. So this is in premise in Oridu, so all the data regulations will be adhered to. And on top of all these call outs that you see here, we work hand in hand with Oridu business because after all, I think they have a lot better sense of this market. So we work with them very closely to ensure that the use cases that we discuss and that we try to put together, they make sense in this world. Okay, so as I said, so I am in a global role, so I keep moving across continents, look at multiple use cases, look at a lot of different use cases. But what I'll try and do is kind of restrict the number of use cases to those that I think can be applied in Oman. So I'm not gonna talk about those perimeter fencing applications that we have done to prevent kangaroos to get into the road, right? So we are gonna talk about specific ones. Okay, so we are talking of smart utilities here. We all know that in utilities, I think one of the biggest ones that we always talk about is around smart meters, which is around automated meter reading. But let me tell you that it doesn't, the buck doesn't stop there. So what do you do? So when you think of a utility company which is operating, it not only is concerned about the meters that it has, but it also has a significant operational 
requirement across its workforce, which you have in digital workforce, and I'm gonna double click on that uh, shortly. You have heavy vehicle monitoring and tracking, so it doesn't stop again at monitoring and tracking, but it also means that you'd be able to do a little bit of predictive analytics on top of that, so that all the devices and all the, all the equipment that they are using is reliable and it kind of works during the lifetime. Last but not the least, asset and inventory lifecycle management. This is about critical assets that the utility company would be specifically concerned about and therefore would like to safeguard its interest there. So what we do there is in utilities, you also have those mandatory audits of specific assets. What you do is you tag specific assets to ensure that they are where they are supposed to be. And at the end of the year, it also enables you to ensure that when the audit process is done and taken care of, it is done in a GIF and you don't spend, uh, send individuals to each of these locations to do the audit. So that's how it works. Some more, I think smart cities is again another buzzword, right? So we've been talking about, I mean, what we have done here is homogeneous buckets of certain use cases. You can always call out and debate that some of these can be used elsewhere as well. Of course they can. But when you look at a smart city concept, Globally, we believe that there are about six or seven specific smart use cases that are being adopted. Smart lighting for sure, all the street lights, there's tremendous savings that you can generate by automating how you operate your street lights. Intelligent traffic management, everyone has to go to office and come back home on time. So of course, you'll have to manage your traffic in a way such that every individual is spending least amount on the road and maximum with where they want to be. Smart environment, that's another, I would say, uh, hyped word, which is also being uh, used by governments everywhere because I think today every government is also concerned about the quality of life that their citizens are leading. And therefore, these smart environments kind of gauge the amount of uh, toxins that are present in the air or let's say the, uh, uh, the pollution that is there. So the various kinds of sensors are there on top of the temperature and humidity and others. Smart waste management. Again, an integral part of a smart city concept. It basically automates not only the waste management, but I would like to say that the concept is about automating the entire process of waste management. So which starts not only with just the bins, but also the people who are managing the bins, which is the fleet which works on the ground. So you manage the entire life cycle of how a waste gets generated to where it, where it ends through automation and IoT. Smart parking. So everyone has to go to the mall during weekends, I guess. So of course there's a problem with parking and smart parking takes care of that. So the concept here is again to be able to book a slot at the ease of your home before you start, you know where you have to park and while you go there, you don't have to make payments, you don't have to speak to someone to get the boom, boom gates working. You just be there and you're navigated to your determined parking lot. Some of the other use cases that we are looking at, smart homes and offices which is uh, about ensuring that the security works properly. Connected buildings, which is about energy management and a lot more, perimeter fencing perhaps, and a lot of things that get into connected buildings. Now these are all, I would say, large use cases that I've talked about and I've tried to cover most of them in a short while. What I wanted to spend more time on today is to talk about specific things that we are doing with Oridu. Okay, so this is an interesting use case for water meters. We have known about uh, automated meter readings for energy meters. The challenge here is if you look at energy meters, you'll always have a power source. But when it comes to water meters, you don't have a power source. So how do you ensure that the meter that you're, or the retrofit fitting or the more communication module that you fit on top of your meters runs for a long period of time and it continues generating the data inputs? So we looked at multiple technologies of how it is being done elsewhere as well. And we found that LoRa is one of those technologies that kind of uh, does it well, because A, it covers a wide range, B, it also elongates the overall battery life. So imagine that if you are pulling about uh, six to eight times the meter reading from a meter, it will still last for about five years. So that's a good enough business case for someone to adopt LoRa. And of course, the volumes are good. In every market, you would have about half a million at least water meters, I think, in Oman as well. So uh, yes, so that's one interesting use case that we are looking to develop with Oridu. Some ground realities. So you know, it's easy to talk about new sensors, but there are few who would talk about retrofitting a used water meter. 
which is to say that the used water meter, which is already in your premises, how do you make them work in a manner such that they become automated? So what you have to do is you typically have to work out a solution which fits on top of your meter, and then it kind of has the communication module, so it takes care of the old meter, so you don't have to replace it, but at the same time, the module kind of takes care of the units that need to be pulled in. This is, this is the case in Oman. There are three water meters that we understand that are uh, usually deployed in Oman. One is Itron, the second is Elster, the third is Balan. And what we did was we went back to our drawing boards, we took the meters, we understood what goes in, what goes out, and we developed the retrofit solution grounds up. So th there are some pictures here. And the one that you see on the white, uh, white and gray, that's the one which is the finished product. So which basically takes care of three things. First is the conversion of analog signals to digital, and then the module, the communication module of a LoRa chipset, and then you have the battery and then the final encasing such that it cannot be tampered with. So that's a live thing that we are testing in the labs today and hopefully we should be able to pull that out very quickly. But what does it mean to utilities, right? So that's the next question. So we, are we have developed interactive dashboards, which is to say that utilities will be able to monitor the usage of water by time, by uh, the category of customer. But on top of that, what it also means is it will help you as consumers to view what you consume at what time and at what uh, rate, right? So you'll be able to basically manipulate the usage of water in a way such that it is in the best interest of how you use it. So these are the interactive mobile apps. So you can even create or uh, log tickets with the utility company to say that, hey, I'm having this problem and I don't think my meter reading is right, which is the elemental uh, motive behind doing an AMR. So you can do that and you can also do a lot of chatbots integration, et cetera, so that everything that you raise can be mitigated quickly. So these are some dashboards of you know, what you will look at. Okay, so this is the final case study that I wanted to bring together. So this is about digital workforce. So I'm not gonna limit it to any particular industry. This is more to do with, let's say various, it's, it's basically a horizontal layer. So it works across all industries. And uh, the intent here was to create something which, is, uh, which protects the interests of the most important assets of us, right, the people. So how do you ensure that your people are working for you at the maximum amount of time and yet you do not intrude into their privacy and yet you can take care of their health risks? So this is a live use case that we have already deployed in multiple parts. Uh, we, are do we are doing a large scale deployment as well with uh, Tata Steel which has assets in Indonesia as well as Australia and India. The challenge here was, let me talk with the, of the challenges, right? So imagine an underground scenario where uh, the, where the, uh, where underground, so you have pit mines, open cut, and then you have underground mines. In the underground mining scenario, you will have people who work in the mines, but how do you track them? Or let's imagine a situation that there's a emergency situation. How do you track an individual as to where that person is located at that given point in time? Or imagine that there's no emergency which is evident to the eye but that individual is facing a health challenge, right? So what we thought was, let's try and bring together all of these elements into one integrated seamless piece. So what does it do and what does it mean? So if you look at this chart, it's the same chart just uh, kind of transposed on the uh, specific use case here. So we have designed certain wrist bands these wristbands use LoRa as a technology for access, which is near term. Why do we use LoRa? Because of course of the penetration. So there are remote locations where you may not have cellular coverage and deep indoors where you may not have GPRS or cellular coverage again. Those are the areas where we would want to use LoRa. This kind of penetrates or, uh, you know, in terms of access, I would say it can range anywhere between 10 kilometers to 12 kilometers. So that's a long range. And then you have your existing infrastructure to do the backhaul. Now, if you use a LoRa gateway, the sensors talk to the LoRa gateway, the LoRa gateway uses the backhaul, and then from the LoRa backhaul, you have the network server and the core and everything. So what does it mean? So essentially what this uh, smart device does are three or four things. Firstly, it has a small button which is almost like an SOS button. So imagine that you are in a situation where you want some help to, be, to come from an external agency, you can press that SOS button and it sends a distress signal 
to the central command center. The central command center obviously is located at a, at a remote or a offshore location, but of course, the entire activity of emergency response can be triggered from there. So that is one. Second is we also do the entire attendance management via this, which basically means that you do, you go, you do away with your access cards, you do away with your biometric systems, you do away with you know, manual supervisors who kind of take attendance of where this individual is at at what time, point in time. And therefore, this single device can give you access as well as it marks attendance of where that individual is. The third element of this is to ensure that your people are in the designated location where they are supposed to be. What that means is, let's take an example of a construction which is happening in a large complex. Imagine that two of these residential towers are already implemented, there are people who are living, and then there's the third tower which is coming up. Of course, there will be boundaries, physical boundaries that will be done, but what happens if a construction worker with a malefied int intention wants to enter into the premises? If he gets his way, then probably he will be able to enter the premises. What we do here is, we do something called as geofencing, which is to say that we will locate an individual and kind of build a virtual boundary within which this person has to reside. Therefore, if an individual who is not designated to leave a certain boundary or an area, if he or she wishes or wants to get out of that area, then it automatically triggers a signal which is sent to the central command center and they can easily communicate with the person. Or they can at least alert the people who are nearby saying that someone is looking to intrude into that area. So that's the essential concept of the, uh, the band that we have developed. On top of that, we are also trying to do, what we are trying to do now is pick up health feed on the fly without any intrusion. So it's basically a non-intrusive device. So it would be able to monitor the body temperature it would be able to know as to whether you know blood flow etc circulation is all right and the temperature etc ambient temperature so it kind of gives you two things one is real time analysis of whether an individual is working or not second it would also be proactive in detecting certain dangers or health hazards that might happen because let's say the pressure is too low or there's a high temperature or there's something which is coming and you want to alert the individual so that's the entire concept i don't know it may be a little too much for one particular uh, slide to imbibe, but we've, I've tried to kind of uh, bring together all of these elements. So this is a snapshot of what I was talking about, geofencing. This is in a oil and gas uh, uh, use case. So what we are saying is the blue ones are the people who are in their designated locations. If you look at the orange tag, it's basically an individual who has ventured outside the geolocation that that individual is supposed to be. So it automatically tells you that an individual has ventured into a zone where he or she is not supposed to get into, and therefore the central command center starts talking to that individual. In an advanced scenario, you can eva even imagine that how do you navigate that individual back to the place that he or she needs to be in. So this is a snapshot of what the device is about. This is another feature. So imagine that uh, you know an SOS is something which is more reactive. What if uh, an individual falls? Right. Or if there's a catastrophe, he falls into a pit and he loses consciousness. He wouldn't be able to uh, you know, uh, activate that button. So what we have done is we are also in building certain things called as shock sensors. It will gauge what is the degree of shock that that individual has uh, received while he or she fell. And therefore, it automatically triggers a preventive kind of a uh, signal to the command center. This can also be extrapolated to what we call as senior safety kind of uh, bands, wherein a senior citizen living in your homes, uh, I think you've talked about a 70-year-old mother, I think it could be useful for you as well, right? So if she falls, yes, it can easily trigger that, uh, you know, something, something is wrong and you can give her a call. Maybe she has just thrown it out of the window, that could be the case. But yeah, so that is another thing. So uh, this, so the, the idea here that I wanted to convey is, uh, IoT will build scale only when you think about the applicability of these sensors beyond just the use case. And therefore, these sensors are being designed and worked out in a way such that they become horizontal and they are not too, very, not too specific because then the restriction would be on usage and the vertical use case. So that's, your, that's how you will be able to develop economies of scale, which is very important because if IoT has to take place, it has to be at a you know, rate which is conducive and uh, it should make business sense. 
So that's how we have been working. We have been working very closely with Urdu, and I'm sure in the labs that we have been uh, trying to test this, we'll uh, hopefully be able to kind of showcase these to more and more customers, and we'll get more from these. So, yeah, that's it from my side. Any questions from you? I'm happy to answer. Yeah. Do you think the LoRa solution can scale up to something which can be economically feasible for the operator? Oh, yes, absolutely. See, the technology that you're going to use of uh, LoRa or let's say the you know, uh, coverage that you use for LoRa is not going to be restricted to one use case. So if, let's say, you have, as an operator, let's say Oridu has created a LoRa infrastructure in Oman, right? So the use cases that it would be able to support through the same infrastructure is the digital workforce, smart meters, and a lot more that I've shown. So I think in terms of economies of scale, once you bring in the network and you start populating those use cases on top of it, there will be enough scale for you to make good ROI. And these are also technologies which are not very capex intensive. So that way, I, th I really think that uh, you know it's a, it's a, an LP as an LPWA technology, LoRa is one of the best that exists in the world today. Yeah, but some of the other competing technologies, they are relying on the cloud, which is creating the economy of scale where they can use the processing power of the cloud to reduce their cost and consequently to reduce their price offering to the end users. Mm -hmm. So how, how does the lower solution compare to the other competing technologies in terms of costing and the pricing? Okay, so in terms of, let's say, putting together an end use case, what are the two components that you need? Be beyond the basic infrastructure I'm just talking about. So let's say you have the sensors that you will need and then you have the vertical application and analytics to run on top of it. The sensors will be developed in a way which is more modular. So essentially, so to say, let's say that uh, you're using a digital workforce solution, you don't want to use LoRa and you want to use maybe NB-IoT. Then what you do is the remaining two layers remain the same, the chipset comes out and the NB-IoT module goes in. So that's the economies of scale that you can derive through by making, let's say, these sensors more modular. When it comes to the back end, if you want to use the same kind of applications for multiple enterprise customers, that's where you'll need a certain degree of customization, but that's more on the south end. But on the north end, it's gonna be almost similar. So I think economies of scale is gonna be generated once you build these solutions in a little more modular manner, and yet be conscious about what SLAs you are signing up to and what kind of you know, south end and north end you have. So I think economies of scale will be generated, and against other technologies as well, it's gonna be very, very competitive. Thank you. Yes, so uh, when you say cellular is available, you're talking of, so your device is using cellular technology, you're saying? The cloud at the top, mm -hmm. uh, and the uh, Uridus or uh, Omantel's network mm -hmm. is like a highway on which I send any car. Right. It will reach. I mean, mm -hmm. so then I don't need the, all these things, right? Okay, so I think, uh, let, me, let me answer it in two, two pieces. First is, you have to be conscious about the use cases that you're looking to ride on this highway, right? So there are specific use cases that will work well with cellular technologies, but there are some where it won't work. So let's say the water meter solution, it just doesn't work on cellular technology. Now let's talk of uh, the infrastructure cost. I'll give you a ballpark estimate. One LoRa gateway which covers anywhere between 10 to 12 kilometers of access costs you anywhere between $3,000 to $3,200. And a fault rate which is less than 1%. 10 kilometers to 12 kilometers, and it is om omnidirectional. It depends on the number of pollings that you do, but a thumb rule would be about 6,000 devices on one gateway. And I'm talking of 14 million messages per day through that gateway. So if you have lesser number of, let's say, messages, of course, the number of devices will reach like 10, 12,000 easily. Anyone else? No? Okay, good. Thank you.